about the high-performance implementation of Swift, which we call Swift T, uh, to differentiate it from the previous uh, Swift, which is Swift K. And again, that ties into the name of the runtime underneath. So we talked about Carajan as the underlying runtime for Swift K. We have a new runtime for Swift that's called Swift T, and it's built on top of MPI. So the idea with this is to be able to translate a Swift script into an MPI program, essentially, that links against our libraries, and then you deploy the whole thing on a big machine like, the, like Mira or Cetus. Okay, and uh, so whereas Swift K would typically, you know, be a workflow language that does Q subs for you, as somebody asked a question about, you know, you can write a workflow that moves some data around, maybe does some Globus transfers, does some Q subs, things like that, all orchestrated by Dataflow. Uh, this model is more about we're going to generate an MPI program and QSub that program once. Okay, so by workflow, we're going to connect a bunch of components that are running on the queue. For example, numerical libraries, application components, things like that. And we're going to glue those all together. So each of those components, though, is going to be packaged in a Swift compatible way. So we're going to package it as, you know, an input, compute, output kind of, uh, you know, functional model, wrap it up, and then compose a bunch of them together into a big Swift program. So, uh, you know, our goals are, or a lot of our goals are similar. Um, although, although the code is quite a bit different. So, you know, we, we want it to be highly programmable. Uh, the user doesn't have to write messaging themselves or things like that. They pass data around through Swift data types. And the messaging and the data transfer is automatic. So it's data-driven computing. And then we do, you know, load balancing and data movement uh, internally. So the overview is, again, to, you know, speed up Swift task rates. So Swift K can, you know, put out about 500 to 1,000 tasks per second. We wanted to be able to get up to 500,000 tasks per second or more, and actually we're up over a, over a billion tasks per second. So that means that we can rapidly pump tasks across a system like the BlueGene Q. Um, we wanted to have the similar goal of writing site-independent scripts, so you write a script, and then the configuration information is separate, so the application logic is separate from the you know, site-specific configuration logic. Again, automatic parallelization through data flow and data movement. Uh, but we wanted to be able to run not just external apps, you know, Mike talked about Command line is, is kind of like the main uh, way to inter to, that Swift K would interact with your application. For Swift T, the main way to interact with the application is by is by linking against it. So you when you uh, when you package an application for Swift T, you typically build up uh, either a, a shared library or a static library, and then tell Swift how to run it. Uh, or you can run a script fragment. So you can uh, we have plugins for Python, R, Julia. And Tickle, in addition, of course, to native code, C, C++, Fortran, so you can easily package these things for Swift T and then call them. So this is a great way to run, you know, uh, 14 million Pythons per second on Blue Waters. Or, and I, I imagine that, that result is from Blue Waters. We've also done Python on the queue, and uh, our examples will show you how to do that. Um, we can run a whole lot of Pythons per second, and then we can pass data around uh, using Dataflow. So it's a really easy way to package up uh, existing code and, and run it. So the model is kind of shown here. We have you know, the top level data flow script that's orchestrating all of the parallelism and the concurrency. Uh, we have some user libraries that might be C or Fortran or C++. And then they kind of get linked into our runtime. And the runtime uses MPI to communicate uh, at runtime. So you kind of QSub the whole thing and everything's packaged together and it runs. Um, the goal was to support billion way concurrency in the, in, for future systems. Um, so what we needed to be able to do was you know spit out tasks that fast, move data around that fast. Uh, so we needed to speed up the way that Swift scripts are evaluated. So we basically needed to build a parallel interpreter for S Swift scripts um, because we needed to be able to control you know billions of tasks, trillions of variables uh, to be able to do that. So we weren't going to fit all of that in memory on one node like the way Swift K typically runs, where you use it as your login node or whatever, and you submit tasks elsewhere. This, in this case, the Swift logic is part of the MPI program, so we distribute all of the processing for that. So in an example like uh, you know, the Swift syntax here, where we have a, a couple of nested for loops, you know, a condition, we're going to evaluate some functions and, 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 and feed the results of, of f, say, into g, and things like that, we basically explode that and break it up into tasks so that each little fragment of that Swift script could potentially evaluate on different parts of the of the runtime and across a whole system like the queue. Um, there's been a lot of work in the runtime and in the compiler to do that. Um, but there's been a lot of work with the Swift T optimizing compiler, which is called STC, to analyze code fragments like the one shown at the top here, which again looks maybe kind of like you know sequential code. Of course, there's no 
instruction pointer, so it's, it's data flow driven. That would, you know, at the compiler would expand that into its, its data flow uh, representation, and then try to optimize where those tasks are gonna run uh, as much as possible at compile time. So it might group and kind of coalesce tasks together. It will coalesce data flow weights uh, and, and really make it easier to run this thing at scale and, and run a whole lot of tasks uh, sequentially. Um, basically, on, we've done a lot of our scaling work so far on blue waters. Uh, for, for a raw case like this, we can run on, uh, basically this is just a basic you know, bag of tasks, run, run something simple everywhere as fast as possible. Uh, you know, for, we can, so we can talk about running tasks that are as short as 10 milliseconds um, and, and make pretty good utilization of 500,000 cores on Blue Waters running at 1.5 billion tasks per second or more. Um, this work that we've done also, you know, covers a lot of different kind of benchmarks. An interesting one um, might be Wavefront, where you're filling in cells in a matrix. You're filling in cell I from cells I minus one, J minus one, things like that. And, and that, so that's a very data flow intensive um, uh, workflow. Um, and there's other cases. So we've done a lot of work to try to make that as fast as possible. Um, it's fast enough that you can actually talk about sending tasks to GPUs on a system like Blue Waters. Uh, this is so you can actually uh, tie into a, a system called GemTC that uh, puts a little service on the GPU, and then Swift can do work stealing and data movement and data flow across the compute nodes. In this case, it says server, but that really is that's that's a service that's part of the Swift T runtime that is gonna be exchanging work and moving data and then firing tasks off either to the, the compute cores on each node or onto the uh, GPU warps that are available on each node. And it's uh, pretty efficient for tasks, um, you know, in, in, the, in the one second or so range. A little bit about how Swift T works at runtime. Um, so let's say you have two, section of, two sections of Swift code that are in different parts of the program um, but there's a data flow dependency between them. How do they synchronize? So uh, in this case, you know, we have some kind of input variable based on n, where we're going to you know, get n from the environment. That might be an input variable of some kind. Uh, we're going to compute something on f, or can we compute, uh, send that as, a, as an input to function f, and then that output is going to be consumed by function g somewhere else in the program. So uh, how does that happen? So basically what we have is we have these uh, control processes that are you know, kind of data flow engines. They're evaluating the data flow and, and kicking off tasks uh, as data flow progresses. And there's a load balancer that's underneath all of this called ADLB that's a, that was developed previously actually. And it has a kind of a task put get uh, API so that you have a bunch of workers that are just requesting work. So you know, when F uh, completes, or when, when F is ready to run, which is immediately because it was operating on input data, that results in a task that is sent out to some worker somewhere. Um, and then meanwhile, the other Swift fragment is basically going to do a subscription on A of 2. And so it will be notified by the worker when, uh, when uh, A of 2 is ready. And then there's a notification. And then that other uh, engine can retrieve the data and then kick off task G. So this is kind of how we distribute data flow operations in Swifty so that we can uh, really scale up the size of the amount of tasks and data we can work on. Yes? So did I hear you say uh, before that uh, Swift really does work well with millions of jobs that, as long as they're under like a second or so? That's right, well you can, you can, uh, you can yeah, you can do millions of jobs. It doesn't, they don't have to be under a second. Uh, we, we, we target those kinds of tasks because those are interesting for benchmarking. Of course, and then uh, have you gone over IO performance yet? Well, um, I haven't with this, but one of the differences with Swift T and Swift K is that Swift T does not need to use files for communication. So we can exchange data just by sending messages around. Okay. So Swift K primarily does data flow through files, um, although it doesn't have to, but when you're gonna call an app program, you basically have to wait for those files to be produced before you can send that somewhere else. In Swift T, again, we're operating on C or Fortran libraries, so basically we either operate on you know scalars or strings or we have a data type called a blob, which is kind of like a byte array, and you can put whatever you want in there, and it's kind of like a message. So when you send that into a function, um, you know, it receives a pointer basically to this, this byte array. And then it can produce a byte array's output, so you don't have to go to the file system. 
as kind of an extension of this idea of calling to C libraries, we basically built some plugins for common scripting languages like Python and R so that um, you know, it makes it easier to basically just kind of uh, you know, get, R, get Python going, uh, put a little fragment of Python in your script and then call it, then you can pass it into NumPy, for example, to do some numerical computing. You can use R for statistics and things like that. You can bundle this all into one, uh, one program and it'll actually run on the queue, for example. So a little bit about how things are compiled. Um, so the tools that are provided, there's kind of two main tools. Uh, there's STC, which is the compiler, and then there's Turbine, which is the, the runtime. So STC is a Java-based compiler. You can run it on your laptop, um, and then you, you compile the, the Swift code. You get this, uh, this stuff we call tick out, which is the Turbine code. That is a portable uh, script itself, actually. So you can send that over to the big machine, and then you basically just MPI exec that program, essentially, okay? So at runtime, you basically have one big uh, MPI invocation going. And on the queue, for example, you would use our tools that wrap up queue sub for you. Um, but that's, the, that's the basic way it works. Sorry, I have a question about something you said earlier. Uh, you, you need, because of the, it's a functional language, you need to enforce that your functions don't have side effects, and yet you're calling C routines or Fortran routines. That's so right. how do you enforce that? We don't enforce that, no. I mean, the C routine can do whatever it wants. So one thing that one thing that people will do, and we have done for applications, for example, in terms of side effects, is we'll cache data in C. So maybe we'll you know read a configuration file, and then uh, the next time that function is invoked on the same process, we'll just skip over reading that configuration file again because the, the data is in memory already. So you know, yeah. But you can also shoot yourself in the foot that way too. If, for example, your your code is not ready to be run repeatedly, for example, if you take an application program that was not designed to be called twice without, you know, exiting, right, um, you, you get, you, there, are, there, there are complexities there. So, but, so the, we, I'm basically saying we don't enforce anything at the C level. We, we don't even look into the C level, really. I'm going to skip ahead so we have time for the examples. I just want to talk about a couple of applications uh, that we've been working on at Argon that might be of interest. One is working with uh, Tom Paterka's group on visualization. Uh, he has a library called DIY for visualization and OSU flow that's built on top of it. And basically what he wanted to do was be able to run OSU flow a whole bunch of times uh, using Swift, even though it's an MPI library. So uh, Swift T can call MPI libraries. It can link against an MPI library. It can create a communicator for you, hand it off to your library, and then find a place for it to run. Um, and in this case, we were basically doing a bunch of, uh, of uh, flow line analysis for the inside of a nuclear reactor. Um, the idea was to split up a bunch of different ways that you can call OSU flow for performance tuning reasons. For example, by splitting up the blocks in the, uh, in the data model and then running each possible combination for you know, different numbers of processes and different block parameters. So basically you have, you know, so this is a typical parameter study you might do with your own code, right? You, you have your code, you wanna see at what levels does it operate the most efficiently and maybe you have some other input parameters like how you block data. You might want to you know, sweep over all of those possible combinations. And Swift's a great way to express, a, express that because that would be just you know, two little for loops. Um, we're able to commu create communicators using MPI com create group, which is this new MPI3 feature to do that. I'll skip over the details, but basically this is the Swift script you know, that solved Tom's problem and evaluated all of the possible BP plus NP uh, parameters, you know, it's just two, two uh, for loops, and then the call to MPI draw, which is uh, the OSU flow application. At runtime, you can get a, a jump shot diagram like this out of Swift T, where you have, where you can kind of see from left to right over time, you know, whether or not your processes are busy. So you can kind of see in this case that it started off by doing mostly small tasks. You can kind of see that there's a little more granularity, and then at the end, it was doing the bigger tasks. So we ran this on 512 cores of Eureka at the time, and you can see it, it makes pretty good use of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the resource. The black is, means it's computing, and the white is are gaps, uh, idle cores. Um, and then basically, you know, in this case, we were doing a performance study, so we were able to isolate you know, the best performance for this uh, code underneath, which turned out to be three points you know, using 256 cores. Um, another interesting application I'll talk about real quick is this uh, multi-scale materials model called CoHMM from uh, Los Alamos. And basically in this model you have two codes. You have this 
higher level uh, stress strain model where you're kind of expanding and shrinking a metal, that's on the left. And then on the right, you have the actual molecular dynamics model underneath. And the idea is that you, know, you, you apply a stress on, the, on the, the, kind of the micro scale model and then you see what the effect is on the molecular model and then, and then back and forth. So you kind of have two kind of codes and it's you know, multi-scale modeling that's a great fit for SWIFT because you end up with a bunch of calls to this uh, molecular dynamics simulator um, and you basically just have a bunch of tasks. So that's great for us. So we started with you know, this CoMD that they provided us. Um, it's a few thousand lines of C. And basically they were already calling it from a higher level script, but they were calling it as a, basically as a command line function or a command line program. So we wanted to be able to kind of like build a library out of that. So we kind of, instead of bundling it as a program, we bundled it as a, as a library. And then um, we basically took their higher level logic, which was this CoHMM. Uh, this is the, again, that's the, uh, the higher level coarser grain macro, uh, you know, stress strain model, which is about 300 lines of C. Again, I, they, they used to call it by basically um, doing an, an exec. Um, but basically we just translated that C code directly into Swift T line by line. And then we were basically able to get, you know, a whole bunch of concurrency out of that. Um, because instead of calling CoMD one at a, once at a time, we were able to call it, you know, hundreds of times. So we start by, you know, first, um, you know, basically creating a function call that calls this CoMD molecular simulator underneath. And then just as an example of, you know, translating from C to Swift, um, we've done this a couple of times with different applications. One thing about Swift is we, we support the C preprocessor, so that makes some of these things a little bit easier to do. Um, also, this kind of shows how, you know, they were previously, you know, calling the, uh, the, the CoMD program here, that string, using P open, and then reading the output of that program over, that, over the pipe. Um, basically, for us, we called it as a library here. So you can kind of see, we were, we were able to go through the program line by line, and then at the top level, we just translated the for loops that were C for loops into Swift for loops. And then we did data flow on time stepping from, from uh, time step to time step. And then basically then what we had was basically a, a parallel, uh, a parallelizable Swift function, Swift routine. Another neat little example of using Swift on a, uh, for a practical problem is building a make file with Swift. So you might want to do make minus J 10,000 on a system like a Cray, where you can compile a program, you know, 10,000 different ways and run it. Maybe if you have your own uh, uh, DSL or if you have some comp compiler strategies or, or blocking strategies uh, that you want to try and you want to try compiling all of them, um, you can do that on a system like the Cray. So basically you translate your make file step by step. Since make is kind of, you know, a data flow language in itself, and it's kind of like Swift, you can kind of come up with, you know, instead of calling GCC, you know, in the, in the make file way, you call it in the Swift way where you wrap it up as an app so you might have an app for GCC, an app for your, your link step, an app for running your program, an app for extracting output from the program, maybe your performance information. And then you can build up, you know, a Swift for loop over all of the possible compiler flags you want to try. And then, you know, Swift's data flow will essentially do what make minus J does, only it'll run on a very large cluster over MPI or on a Cray or something like that. And I think that's it. I should probably stop here. Right?